So thank you uh, everyone for uh, coming. My name is Randall Hansen. I'm the director of the Center for European, Russian and Eurasian Studies at the Monk School. And today we have an outstanding panel with three very distinguished guests who are based in the Federal Republic of Germany. And I'll introduce them, perhaps you could, oh, your names are there, perfect. We have Sebastian Hanisch, who's Professor of International Relations and Foreign Policy at the Institute for Political Science at Heidelberg University. Kai Oppermann, Professor for International Relations at Chemnitz, at the Chemnitz University of Technology. And Dr. Irena Solonenko, Senior Fellow at the Center of Liberal Modernity, a think tank based in uh, Berlin. Herzlich willkommen, schön, dass Sie hier sind. Now, in terms of our format, we'll have about 45 minutes of moderated uh, discussion with the panelists, and then we'll open it to Q&A. Uh, please send in your questions, and I will uh, read them out to the speakers. I can't promise to get all of them, but get to all of them, but we will do, of course, our best. And before we be, finally begin, let me thank our sponsors, the Petro Yatsik Program for the Study of Ukraine, and this ACERIS, the Center for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies uh, itself. Now, uh, we've held uh, dozens of these uh, webinars. We like to begin with people on the ground in Ukraine. Dr. Solonenko, you're not on the ground in Ukraine, but you are Ukrainian. You've done extensive work on Ukraine. Uh, let, to get us started, could you summarize briefly the view in Kyiv on German foreign policy in the run-up to the invasion, please. Yes, um, thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you for having put together this panel. It's a very important issue, the role of Germany. Um, so Ukraine uh, is now very much disappointed with Germany and it was already disappointed before the invasion because the, uh, the Russian um, troops built up started in April last year or even yes, around April last year. And uh, there were a lot of voices coming from Ukraine, from some uh, think tanks in Germany calling for uh, for Germany to put uh, on hold Nord Stream 2, which Germany was still uh, was determined to complete and start uh, make it operational and to deliver weapons to Ukraine because um, it was clear that Russia is planning something the Ukrainian army is not in the same uh, is not so well equipped as the Russian army. Uh, so this, so there was a disappointment, um, and um, now it has it has grown even more. Um, I can elaborate more on different aspects, but um, no, that's that's perfect. This and will we'll, be the short summary. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. We'll circle back to some of that. Um, Professor Hanish, would you uh, agree with that assessment, or how would you react to it? I have to admit that I would agree to that also from a German point of view or from my personal point of view. I think the German response has been uh, tippet and it has been not in the right way pursued uh, in the last weeks as well as in the time before. Uh, but I also have to uh, say that uh, many European nations got it wrong. Uh, we have seen uh, French intelligence chiefs um, leaving uh, office uh, after not predicting what was to come. So uh, it may not be uh, the best excuse, but I think the German government as a whole got it wrong with regard to reading what Vladimir Putin obviously decided uh, in late January that he would go forward with this invasion. After that, of course, the Germans has been like a meal stream rather than a shock and awe campaign. And I would predict uh, that it would uh, gain uh, some um, acceleration over the coming weeks, but not much, I have to admit. Okay, let me uh, ask you two follow up on that before turning over to Professor Opperman, focusing on, on the narrow but important issue of intelligence. Why did the US get it so right and so many European countries who are literally and metaphorically, depending on where you are, just next door? How did they get it so wrong? And then 
particularly for our, our members of the audience who under, don't understand, may not understand German politics, why has it been such a sort of slow development since then? So much debate, moving back and forth, promising delivery, backtracking on that. I mean, that says something about the nature of German politics, I think. So could you speak to those mm. two, two issues, please? I think, first of all, there's a lot of past dependency in the German belief that the Russians wouldn't be as stupid as Vladimir Putin has been with this invasion. In the end, I think most Germans still think it was not only a big mistake, uh, but also a tragic mistake um, that will turn Russia back into time um, uh, by decades um, as a country, not only Ukraine, of course, but also uh, the sanctions and so forth. On the other hand, I think uh, quite a few Europeans got it wrong with regard to intelligence. I still remember uh, Ukrainian President Zelensky arguing that uh, US and British intelligence was wrong on the upcoming war or was overstated. So that is, again, no good excuse that the Germans got it wrong, but I think it was hard uh, for Germans to believe that they would uh, change such a long-standing policy. And you could see that by uh, getting the German intelligence chief uh, trapped on February 24th, 25th in Kiev. Um, and he tried then was brought out of the country. Um, so he didn't expect it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, actually, Dr. Solenenko, let me uh, let me have you respond to that. I mean, if Zelensky yeah. was telling the Germans in February or January that an invasion was unlikely, uh, why was it so surprising that they thought an invasion was unlikely? So G Germans in generally, or Germany in generally, has had many misconceptions or misperceptions about, about what Russia is about, about also joint history of uh, Russian-German relationship. So first, uh, there, uh, there has been little understanding of what kind of political system in Russia is, and that Vladimir Putin is taking decision with a, is being advised maybe by a small number of people, very limited number of people, and they probably don't report the full story to him, and he gets also limited information, which is the result of this kind of autocratic regime. And um, uh, this has not been misunderstood in uh, Germany because Germany has this long tradition of uh, economic relationship with Russia, whereby Germany, whereby Russia supplies uh, resources, natural resources, and Germany supplies technologies. And this, this has a long tradition and um, this Russia first policy where Russia is a very important partner also has a um, has a tradition so within this tradition it was very difficult to understand to understand the real nature of russian regime this is one aspect and also if we come back to the story of the second world war uh, in germany this feeling of guilty with respect to russia dominates although we know that uh, the uh, ukraine and belarus has suffered much more during the second world war it was not and uh, and russia is seen as a liberator somehow in germany although half of the germany was occupied by Russia after the Second World War, or by the Soviet Union. So for me, it's, as a Ukrainian, knowing what kind of regime the Soviet Union was uh, is um, ridiculous. To I, I, I cannot really understand this. Um, uh, so uh, this would be the short answer. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks very much. Let me let me um, bring Professor Opperman into that discussion and kind of two issues you might want to uh, address there. Uh, the first is this general one of how you know how did how did Germany how did the Foreign Office get it so wrong? I mean, it strikes me if you walk down the average street in England and said, "What kind of man is Putin?" You know, the the proverbial person in a pub, they would have said, "He's a bully and a thug," and somehow that message didn't get through to the Foreign Office. So how did they get it so wrong? A misjudging uh, Putin, B making Germany uh, so dependent for its energy on um, Russia. And then related to that, this might be an unfair question, but let me throw it out. I've asked this before to my German friends. German assumption of responsibility for World War II is admirable. Its guilt towards countries it's invaded 
is admirable. But why does that guilt not extend or did not extend to Ukrainians when so many of the Russians that the Wehrmacht killed were in fact Ukrainians? Professor Opperman? Yeah, okay. Um, so I think first, first, I think it's important to, to understand or to, to see that I believe, uh, first of all, I, I, I share the disappointment, right? Um, uh, I, I just think it's, it's not, I mean, it's not only the government or the foreign office that, that is to, to blame here. So, um, um, I mean, what Irina has pointed to that um, this kind of idea that diplomatic and economic engagement with Russia is good is deeply ingrained and important, is deeply ingrained in German political culture, um, uh, both on an elite level uh, and on a public opinion level, if you like. And that has only partly to do, I believe, with World War II, but also with this example of Ostpolitik, yeah, um, uh, that, that is seen in Germany um, um, as a kind of a successful uh, policy that led to detente or that enabled detente, and, and that is kind of seen very, very positively. In the uh, Foreign Office, for example, I mean, there's a kind of, I believe, an organizational culture that has very much internalized this idea that peace and security in Europe is only possible with Russia, not against Russia. Diplomatic economic engagement helps with that. I mean, you have to think about the previous leaderships of the Foreign Office. Um, SPD, social democratic uh, ministers who obviously have particularly perhaps internalized this uh, way of thinking, although I should add clearly that is a more general thing that that, that counts or that, that is true for the uh, conservatives um, as well. On the level of public opinion, I mean in particularly in particular in Eastern Germany, clearly we have um, a, a strong view that, that diplomatic engagement with, with Russia is a good thing. I mean Nord Stream 2 was mentioned. I mean, everybody, literally everybody was criticizing Germany for it. I mean, uh, I've been to the US, talked to decision makers, they couldn't believe it, that we are, that Germany is so naive in believing this is only an economic project and will help kind of improve relations with Russia. And that brings me to my second point, with, which is strategic culture. I mean, Germany just has a, I don't know how to put it, um, unlike the UK, since you mentioned uh, uh, the UK, um, uh, not a strategic culture that um, would enable German decision makers or facilitate strategic debate and thinking. Uh, and this is always what, what drives Americans crazy that we are so naive or elites are so naive in uh, thinking about these things in terms of interdependence and, and, and so on. So I think that is, I mean, it's not an excuse, but I think it's an explanation why in particularly perhaps for Germany, it was so difficult after 24th of February to all of a sudden uh, change track and realize that everything we have thought for so long and believed was perhaps not right. Yeah, interesting. I, I liked your role reversal there of the uh, naive Europeans because the usual view from, from the capitals of Europe it is that the Americans are the naive cowboys that oversimplify things. So that's an interesting uh, re-spinning of an old, an old dichotomy. Uh, perhaps you can say a little bit more about Ostpolitik, just in case some of our listeners don't know the history of, uh, of that and, and why the Germans think it was such a success. Yeah, so Ostpolitik um, goes back or is linked in particular to former Chancellor uh, um, uh, Willy Brandt, uh, but Egon Barr would be another uh, uh, important figure there. Um, and the idea was, I mean, we, uh, it's 1970s, right? Uh, and uh, the, the height of, of the Cold War. Um, and the idea was that uh, by um, um, uh, engaging diplomatically, with um, the East European countries, the Soviet Union, uh, the GDR, establishing diplomatic relations with these countries um, would kind of bring them to the table of discussions about things like human rights, which would then over the long uh, uh, term bring them closer to our values and create a common ground for discussing peace and security, the organization of peace uh, and security in Europe uh, together, uh, rather than uh, this kind of uh, Reagan comes later, I know, but uh, this kind of evil empire uh, and confrontation between the two blocks. And so from a German kind of narrative, <laughs> it's almost as if Germany won the Cold War, right? Uh, because of, uh, of this Ostpolitik, which is of course something that again in America is kind of ridiculed, but it's kind of, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm over, I'm exaggerating here, but it's clearly seen as a huge, as a great success. And only Germany because of German history, because of Germany's 
position in Europe is able to play this role of, of, of bridge, if you like, between Russia and the West. And we should do that. We should do that diplomatically. And that brings something to the table that others can't bring to the table. Yeah, I know. Very interesting. And I think that's absolutely right. And when you try and convince um, German scholars or you know, members of the educated German uh, public that Ronald Reagan's arms buildup in the early 1980s, Weinberger, Reagan, Reagan, that this brought the Soviets to the bargaining table, that argument gets you nowhere. It's all Gorbachev and Ostpolitik and Reagan was ranting in the corner, but luckily he didn't blow up the, the whole world and we were able to, to move here. Um, uh, Professor Hanisch, let me let me bring you in on that because I th I still think there's a question of how Germany could let itself become so dependent on one country for its energy supplies. And I think did did no one read a book on the early 1970s and what happened to the United States when it was overly reliant on first Saudi Arabia and and Iran? Did this Occur to no one that diversification might be a good idea. Well, I'm 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 tempted to respond that this debate reminds me of the U.S. debate. How could the U.S. become so dependent on China as of mm -hmm. late, right? So I think there was a, a wrong consensus in the West that asymmetrical interdependence could work on behalf of the West rather than the other side. And for a very long time, the experience in Germany was, we can handle the Russians because they are more dependent on us and our money than we are on their um, energy supplies. And of course, there was a deliberate policy of diversification, both in the European Union and in Germany wrong-headed in the way that it didn't start earlier. Let's say a 2008 uh, invasion of Georgia or at least 2014 invasion of Crimea. That we are still in 2022 talking about dependency rates like 50 or 35 percent depending on oil or gas. So that was especially wrong. But let me remind you that other nations, in, in, including Ukraine and Poland, were still transferring gas through pipelines while this war was ongoing. And they were profiting from this transfer to Western Europe. Of course, they are dependent on this money as well. And they have profited from it. Uh, as well as other nations, uh, the Baltic states have been heavily dependent for a very long time on, on Russian oil and gas supplies. The trouble with Germany is, is twofold, I would argue. First, it's a, it's a very big customer and it's supposed to have a leadership role in Europe. Uh, where it, as Irina has rightly pointed out, it failed big time. And the second thing I have to admit as a German, of course, Germans or at least German foreign policy has this self-righteousness and this moralistic overtones oftentimes. And now that we are in a situation where Germany has not performed as expected, this moral overbearance comes back because our partners are saying, well, after all, the Germans, if not alone, to a major part, you are responsible for what has happened to Ukraine, right? That's the impression I get from the questions I get uh, from partners as well as on this panel. Of course, Germany has a large responsibility, but we are in a war right now. And of course, everyone is muted about who is responsible for to which degree uh, for the onset of this war. And I think it will take a long time and a hard look on 
who was in charge of what at which point in time. Yeah, very, very interesting comment. I mean, uh, two thoughts in reaction. One, we have lots of models where economic integration has worked. I mean, the European Union is anchored on that. War became inconceivable between France and Germany when it was very conceivable for over a century because of the integration of, of coal and steel. So it wasn't an idiotic idea, even if it didn't pan out um, in this particular case. Um, and, and I think generally, if you look at the Eurozone crisis, the refugee crisis, there's a great tendency all across Europe and indeed the world to let the Germans take the blame when it, when it goes wrong. So I, I think you point to two, two interesting um, corrections that we need to keep in mind. Uh, Dr. Solonenko, let me hand that back over to you. you. Ukraine itself should look into its back, own backyard. It isn't entirely innocent of energy dependence on, on Russia. What do you think? Uh, I would like to say that actually the uh, Russian transit, uh, the transit of Russian gas and uh, in and uh, the build uh, the construction of the Nord Stream two, it was a security issue for Ukraine. Uh, uh, it was not about it was about economic profit as well, but uh, uh, but it was I think much more a security issue has become much more a security issue as a, as a Nord Stream two was about to be completed, uh, because uh, in Ukraine there was a perception if. Uh, Russia is not anymore dependent on this transit of its gas to Europe. Uh, it, uh, it, it might invade Ukraine, there might be some explosion, whatever. So this was a security issue for Ukraine. And uh, uh, indeed, Ukraine was also uh, very much dependent on Russian gas, but it changed in 2014 with the help of the European Union. Uh, European Union helped to arrange this transit uh, gas supply and uh, since 2015, I guess Ukraine was uh, zero dependent on gas coming directly from Russia. So this is very important. And I would like to um, mention one issue we haven't mentioned yet, but it was very important. It's very important and it picks up on the point uh, Professor Oberman man, um, mentioned that uh, Germany believes in peace uh, with, with Russia, with, uh, not against Russia. And uh, the, the role of Germany in negotiation, negotiating Minsk agreement. And um, uh, so uh, basically in Ukraine, it was, Ukraine was forced to sign these both agreements because it was, uh, in, there was a danger of imminent, um, in, uh, so Russian troops were basically on the Ukrainian territory in both cases in September 2014 and February 2015. And Ukraine was basically forced to sign them. So it's clear that these agreements were uh, kind of, um, uh, um, were a tool to stop uh, this fighting, or but were not a tool to uh, establish uh, sovereignty, Ukrainian sovereignty and uh, territorial integrity. And Germany believed this was a tool and basically uh, forced, uh, um, was negotiating with Russia and was one of the parties together with France, which were forcing Ukraine to make concessions to Russia which were not acceptable for Ukraine. And this brings me to the situation today. Uh, the call of uh, Macron and Scholz with Putin on Saturday was very much, was negatively perceived in Ukraine. And there are fears that uh, again, um, France and Germany negotiating with uh, Putin over Ukraine's head about uh, whether Ukraine should give up part of its territory and other things, uh, whether Germany wants to have Minsk three, uh, sort of, you know, and, um, uh, so I think this is very important, and I wonder if this, if it not, it doesn't have a deeper, deeper roots than Ostpolitik. Um, I mean, as a Ukrainian, uh, we, we remember that Germany used to be an empire, and we remember this relationship between Germany and Russia in the past, yeah, and um, and um, kind of I I felt this all the time that kind of Germany sees Russia and kind of gray space in between, you know. At some point, Poland appeared in this space after 2014, Ukraine sort of appeared there. But still, this Russia focus on Russia was very much, I felt this very strongly. Um, so, um, so I think this uh, maybe this um, perception uh, or respect of big, of large countries, I don't know, rather than small countries, <laughs> uh, maybe plays a role as well, you know. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, Professor Hanish Oppermann, do you like to react to that? Is this a great power reflex? We 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 dig out Metternich, we bring him to the table, we <laughs> we we cut a deal between Berlin and Moscow, and we tell the Ukrainians that that you know they've got to accept this because it's the best for them. Shall I go first, Kai? 
you know, either of you <laughs> give you some more time. Um, actually, I can understand that. I heard that many times, uh, uh, the sentiment about Germany. I don't think that the German political class or the government in place right now has any um, idea which comes close to that. We are a European nice nation. Now we are we despise great power politics in this way. Um, there are hardly any people in the political spectrum. Maybe the AFD, maybe parts of the left party, but that is probably less than 10% of the political spectrum right now. Um, on the other hand, uh, of course, there is an ongoing debate in Germany, which may be very irritating, not only to Ukrainians, but particularly for Ukrainians, where the Germans think, because they have been so um, responsible for this war, that they should in some way influence the Russians. And there, I think, there is a great overestimation of the self-importance of the German position vis-a-vis -vis Russia. If Russia reacts to someone or something, then it is nuclear powers and the United States, right? So questions about multiple rocket launchers from the United States matter, but not five or six tanks from Germany. Because uh, when you look at the military situation in Ukraine, the United States by far is the only power that matters to the defense, for the defense of, um, of Ukraine right now. Maybe one or two exceptions in, in, in special um, armory, but uh, other than that, the United States is the country uh, which calls the shots there. Right. Very helpful. Uh, Professor Oppermann. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Yeah, so I also, I mean, again, I understand the, how things are perhaps perceived uh, in Ukraine, but I don't think it's, um, it's a valid point that this kind of German uh, approach to Russia has anything to do with a great power reflex. I think it's rather the opposite. Um, that, that Germany um, is not or lacks the kind of strategic culture to understand uh, how a country like Germany may have uh, uh, um, some sort of influence and or does have responsibility for peace and security um, in, in Europe. I mean, I, for example, the Minsk agreement is a good example. And I found it interesting what Irina said, because in Germany, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Sebastian, but uh, this is seen as a successful example of Germany finally using its diplomatic uh, kind of uh, leverage uh, to broker uh, an agreement um, that, you know, the, um, the American administration kind of asked Germany to take the lead on that. And that is seen um, as an example of successful diplomatic leadership uh, in Germany, which kind of reinforces this uh, view that uh, uh, diplomatic engagement with Russia um, is, is, is very, very um, important. Um, so I think it's less of, it's not a great power reflex in Germany at all. It's more like a lack of strategic understanding of Germany's role in Europe, perhaps, um, that is um, responsible for this naivety when it comes to, to Russia. Very interesting. I want to move on to uh, Angela Merkel, which is a question so I'll incorporate it into my questions. It's basically mine. But before that, I want to come back to uh, Dr. Salonenko and, and just raise two issues: um, contingency and alternatives. So there is an element of we're, we're reviewing this whole thing as overdetermined since it happened. But imagine a world in which um, Putin had Boris Johnson's kind of party habits, and he was getting pissed in the Kremlin with his aides every night. In the midst of this, he caught COVID. And, and died. Well, then February 24th wouldn't have happened, or at least it's hard to imagine it happening. So how much of this is a kind of awful but contingent outcome rather than a, a structured one or one that we really could have predicted, question one. And question two, when we think of alternatives, I mean, the Americans are 
uh, moralizing at the moment, waxing indignant about German dependence on uh, Russia, but they're dependent on Saudi Arabia, a regime that murders journalists. It's not obvious to me that being in hoc to Riyadh is so much uh, better than being in hoc to, to, to Moscow. So I wonder if there isn't, you know, had, had Germany shifted its dependency a decade ago towards Saudi Arabia, the, the cries of criticism from the left uh, would have been deafening. So it, is there an element in which we can understand how the Germans found themselves in this, this position? Dr. Solonenko. Um, as, as I couldn't, I, I couldn't, uh, I didn't really got the question, yeah, so if you could... Um, so the, the question is, how much of this is contingent on the mad dictator that is Putin? So had Putin died... Yeah, okay. COVID, yeah, I see. So this role of the personality, I see, yeah, yeah. rather than regime as such, yeah. Mm -hmm. In Saudi Arabia, dependence on Saudi Arabia is so much better than dependence on Russia. Yeah. Um, yeah, indeed. I mean, I think so. I think so that, of course, uh, it was very much Putin's decision. We know this, uh, but uh, I think in the long term perspective, um, at least from the Ukrainian perspective, Russia has always been an aggressor, has always been, has always been an empire, which never ceased to be an empire, whether it was the Russian empire before the Soviet Union or the Soviet Union or Russia after the Soviet Union. We know the texts from Putin, from Medvedev, which basically deny Ukraine of the right to have a state and a nation and so on. So it is an empire, and I think the, there are um, deeper structural problems in Russia with respect to this. So at this particular moment, of course, it was Putin's decision, but in the long-term perspective, uh, I think uh, sooner or later something like this would happen. And uh, this is also very important to understand it now, because uh, there has been a discussion in Germany, and Scholz made it very explicit at the beginning of the war, that it's Putin's war, it's not uh, German society, it's not Russian society. Whereas in Ukraine, we tend to see deeper roots of this uh, imperialist policy uh, and uh, it's uh, so for us we think if Putin is not stopped in Ukraine now and some concessions will be made after some time Russia will uh, invade another country Baltic states uh, Georgia Moldova so uh, anyway and then Baltic states perhaps and even further uh, so uh, for so I think there is this imperial re reflex which never was um, dealt with, uh, like Germany, it, dealt with, it dealt with it with its past in a very good way, and Russia has never confessed for solo key for uh, Stalin's repressions and so on, yeah? And I think if you haven't done this job, internal job, then it will come later in a different form as an aggression. Yeah, no, uh, very fair points. And Saudi Arabia is not an imperialist power or at least it's not been expansionist since the 1910s and the 1920s, uh, mm. when it was very expansionist. Um, thanks very much. Let's move on to Angela Merkel and her legacy. We held a panel uh, here at the Monk School, here at Ceres, uh, with the German embassy in September. And I have to say, we from the school tried to be as critical as possible, but it was really a love-in about how wonderful Angela Merkel was, these 16 wonderful years, on and on and on. Um, but none of us talked enough about Russia and certainly not enough about Ukraine. So my question is this, do you think that we will fundamentally reevaluate Merkel's legacy in the light of this war, uh, both her, her proximity to Moscow, selling us a bill of goods that she as a Russian speaker understood this, this man, and also her knee-jerk decision after Fukushima to immediately withdraw from nuclear power without Oops. Uh, I lost you, Randall. Yeah, yeah. I was wondering where the Randall problem is. Randall is yeah. frozen. Yeah. Um, but um, well, can continue Irina, discussion. do you want to go ahead <laughs> on Angela Merkel? Oh, no, you can go. Randall, oh. we lost you for a couple of seconds. Oh, right. Sorry. 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 Um, I'm not sure how much of that you... Uh, you got so the question. The question first to, to you, Sebastian, was: Will we reevaluate Merkel's legacy in light of uh, 
her depend her relationship with Moscow and her knee jerk move out of nuclear power without alternatives being built up. Uh, well, maybe. Uh, I'm not so sure because most of the policies driven towards Russia were done by SPD foreign ministers. So Steinmeier has a large stake in that. Of course, she was the chancellor. But then again, of course, her position in world politics was quite easy at the time because you had all those crazy dictators uh, or autocrats or democratically elected presidents, which really acted in, in, in difficult ways, not only for Germans, but also for Canadians. So in a way, I think this perception in late 2021 is a perception among others. And there, of, of course, she will always be the bright light, uh, of course. Uh, when it comes to Russia, though, of course, she takes a lot of the responsibility for this complacency in Germany about energy uh, diversification and really the moralistic, I have to repeat myself, overbearing, we can get out of nuclear energy at the same time run the best climate uh, policy of the continent and then not being dependent on Russia at the same time, right? That's a little bit too much uh, for one country to do. It's a lot of promises to the German electorate. And there I have to say, of course, the popularity of the <coughs> now economic uh, uh, Minister Habeck uh, in Germany is a direct result that he is telling people the truth about that if Germany has to change now, it will cost us all, the whole electorate. And therefore, I think you could already see in the electorate like a soft response, right? Because somehow the people have the sentiment, well, maybe the political class didn't tell us the whole truth during the Merkel era. And so in this way, I think uh, there is this undertone already in the German debate, but it will not uh, be personalized with regard to this female chancellor. I think that holds a very long way in German history because she is really an outstanding political figure, especially for the younger generation who just doesn't know any other politician than Angela Merkel, right? 16 years is a very, very, very long time. Yeah, but that's something the Teflon candidate does in it. I mean, one can't have it both ways. One can't take credit for Germany's economic success from 2006 until she left, though, frankly, that was built on the back of social democratic reforms to the economy from which she profited, and then the social democrats simply tried to disavow them. Um, you can't do that on the one hand and then not take responsibility for this fundamental foreign policy decision. And, and wasn't there something of base political politics about the Fukushima? I mean, that wasn't simply about saving the planet. That was about cozying up to the Green Party so that she could form a coalition at the next election. Randall, I have to admit, I mean, she, the CDU was the last party in the whole party spectrum that was turning uh, against nuclear power. So she, CDU was the latecomer after mm -hmm. Fukushima. And therefore, it's a consensus. And if you if you blame people for this energiewende, then you have to blame everyone, uh, in particular the Greens. And of course, the Greens, I have to admit, Germany will outpace probably most Eastern European nations in its energiewende right now, because we will be stronger on renewables in comparison to Poland and many other countries, right? So again, I hate to say it, but Germany will probably stick its neck out in late 2023 uh, 
uh, and say, well, we've done it, right? Because uh, we have the power to do it quite fast now. Now we are looking uh, like a beggar, but as a big economy, you know, this will shift quite dramatically in 2023 already. Mm, yeah, very interesting. Yeah, we often forget that OPEC was an economic disaster, but led to a massive reduction in, in oil use. And it was yes. projected to something like double over the next 20 years, and it basically was flat after OPEC. Uh, very interesting. Professor Oppermann, did you want to come in on any of that? I think I, I, I agree. I mean, just as what we said about Putin, I think it's um, um, uh, equally right to say that that it's not Merkel as a, as a person who is kind of responsible for, for the Russia policy we had um, about nuclear power. I mean, I think this is one of the misconceptions from the outside I often hear. Um, as if uh, in, in Germany, all, everybody's now regretting uh, this, this move or blaming uh, America for it. I mean, she was blamed for being a flip-flopper uh, because, I mean, she undid the decision of the previous government to go out of nuclear and then just flip-flopped after this uh, Fukushima incident. So that is what she's criticized for, but I don't think... Uh, that in Germany, uh, unlike in France, we now all think, well, nuclear power is the future and, and the clean energy. I don't think that's right. Um, I mean, um, given, I mean, I, I do think that uh, on an elite level, uh, the kind of um, uh, books about Angela Merkel will be rewritten uh, in light of what has happened. But on a public opinion level, I agree with Sebastian. I the jury is still out in a way if that really affects her because I mean she is also still quite clever in a sense because she is not saying anything mm -hmm. yeah? uh, so she is not defending her record or uh, uh, mea culpa arguing that she got it wrong she's, she's not doing it she is no longer in power so I think uh, even now out of office she you know is a kind of clever politician in that sense yeah, very interesting. Uh, one last question before we go to the, the Q&A, um, and that is the role of the Greens in all of this. How is it that the party of the peace ge uh, generation, of, of the, the peace protests of the 1980s, how have they become so hawkish? I'm sure you've seen the kind of Heute uh, show satires on Hofreiter, who, who's an expert in every imaginable form of weapon, and he wants it all delivered to, to Ukraine tomorrow. What explains that, that flip in the Greens, which has been so much more definitive than the Social Democrats? I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not a short-term flip, if you like. It's a long-term development, um, which, you know, I mean, starts um, um, well, certainly when they took power uh, under the uh, uh, first Red Green government, but even before that, when uh, this kind of narrative uh, of never again war was kind of redefined as never again uh, Auschwitz, never again uh, genocide. Mm -hmm. uh, and the argument in order to achieve never again genocide, perhaps sometimes, um, um, Germany needs to accept uh, uh, um, that that, their, that military force is necessary. And that uh, this discussion, this debate has played out in the Greens more, I believe, than in any other uh, party, certainly more uh, than in the um, Social Democratic Party, which is why. Um, and then on top of that, I should add that after this kind of uh, change in narrative, clearly the membership of the Green Party also changed completely. So this old divide between the left-wing radicals, let's say, and the more re re realpolitik uh, wing, has uh, the, the balance of, of uh, influence in the party has mm -hmm. shifted to the latter, which is why uh, it's not only since yesterday that the Greens are uh, kind of uh, reliable, if, if, if I can put it that way, supporter uh, of a more proactive role of Germany in international affairs. And with regards to Russia, one has to say that uh, the Greens were the party that were perhaps the first one who were more critical of Russia than the others, and clearly more, definitely more critical of Nord Stream 2, right? They are called for uh, this project uh, to be uh, uh, scrapped much earlier than, than anybody else. So in this mm. sense, they were right, but, um, um, you know, still um, uh, they, they didn't kind of win the argument overall, I believe. But I, I, I guess that for the Greens, uh, um, that's not a surprise uh, what we see now uh, from this longer term yeah, yeah. development. 
Very, very interesting. Uh, I want to go Q&A, but um, Dr. Solonenko, I want to give you your fair due. Did you want to react to any of that before we open to yes. questions? Uh, I, would, I, would, I would add, I, I agree absolutely that this, uh, these are two different questions on if you never gain war and never gain Auschwitz. And it's very important to talk about the second, maybe in the current context more than the first. And uh, the Green Party has always worked very closely with human rights fora in Russia, which was very active in, in the 90s. And these human rights activists were actually warning the West that it will, will get uh, uh, it will get worse. Yeah, so you you don't mm -hmm. have you don't appease Russia. It will get worse. They were warning mm -hmm. the West, and the Green Party has more kind of expertise. Let's put it this way: on on when it comes to Russian regime, because it has more contact, had more contact with opposition with the human rights uh, fora. And I would like to add also. Um, it, it should come in Q and A, but the two important issues now is that I think is the delay of uh, supply of weapons. Uh, on the weekend, there was a article of the Welt, uh, Die Welt uh, um, a newspaper, which uh, told that that uh, Germany basically didn't supply any weapons in the past uh, nine weeks, and uh, whereas this is what Ukraine really now needs now because of the bad fight in, in the east of Ukraine. And the second issue, we are awaiting the decision of the European Council in the 24th of June, where Ukraine wants to get a candidate, EU candidate status, uh, candidate country status. And we know that Germany is kind of against it yet so far. And uh, so I, I, I'm wondering, uh, so we, we, I think it was, it was discussing this, and uh, also I want to mention that because uh, so maybe on the negative side, but on the positive side, side after 2014, Germany was the, the second largest donor to Ukraine after the European Union as a whole, and it helped a lot with decentralization, with a lot of democracy-related reforms. And actually, we see now that the mayors in the war play a big role, and I think it's a result of the de decentralization policy. Uh, so there are there are a lot of positive sides as well. Absolutely, we we have to see it as a whole. Yeah. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, the decentralizing point is, is a fascinating one. I hadn't thought of that. Um, that was actually the first question on the Die Welt, uh, story, which has been uh, republished in the Kiev uh, Independent. So, uh, Professor Harnish, could you react to that? Why are these weapons not, that are, weapons that have been promised not being delivered? It's possible, but I have no intelligence on that, whether that is true. The, the Welt is um, um, a German newspaper that is closer to the opposition party CDU at this point. So uh, they should be well informed. They could uh, try to do that for political reasons. So I can't speak to that. I would be interested whether it is confirmed by Ukrainian sources uh, officially, because that would be uh, the obvious confirmation. So Mr. Melnik, the Ukrainian, very active Ukrainian ambassador to Germany, if he twitters that this is right and it's a scandal, I would be a little bit suspicious if uh, the Ukrainian official response is muted to that mm -hmm. because it could be, uh, uh, yeah, a political scheme uh, by either a journalist or a newspaper. Um, but other than that, I have no private information on it. Okay, very, very interesting. Um, I do have a, a bit of a, a, a follow-up military question in that much of the debate in the German newspapers is about the delivery of tanks. I wonder, though, if that's what the Ukrainian army needs and i'm glad to be corrected but it doesn't seem to me that getting into a tank battle with the red army is the wisest military strategy when so much of ukraine's stunning success sort of dazzling all of us has been based on a classic paramilitary strategy relying on drones heat sensor deactivating technology anti-tank tank missiles and and howitzers so i wonder mm -hmm. if this this tank delivery uh, debate isn't a distraction. Does anyone want to react to that? I, I, I believe that what I think is uh, not very helpful is um, to discuss this under the umbrella term of heavy weapons. Um, mm -hmm. And this, I believe, is how it is framed in Germany, because I do believe, although I'm not a military expert, I do believe it depends on what uh, kind of heavy weapons you deliver. And the same is true for tanks. Um, 
from my understanding, certain tanks would be useful, or are useful, like anti-aircraft tanks, um, um, for example. And there, I believe, from what I'm like, Sebastian, I don't have any private information, but clearly the data uh, that, that we see, um, hopefully it's, a, it's, it's, it's right, it's correct data, that Germany has delivered weapons worth 190 million uh, euros, which is still not much, to be honest. Uh, because uh, Estonia has more than that, 200 million. Uh, yeah, and not to uh, speak about the US, who has 3.5 billion. But I think what is definitely uh, uh, the case is that these uh, so called Gephardt tanks uh, that Germany promised to deliver have, I believe, not yet been delivered. Uh, but for uh, reasons to do with maintenance, I believe. Uh, but again, correct me if I'm wrong. So, and the last point is that it's almost well, I'm not saying it's uh, uh, irrelevant whether it's true or not, but what is clearly very important is that uh, the impression exists everywhere in Europe uh, that Germany is not uh, 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 delivering uh, on its promises. And that in itself is extremely harmful and problematic uh, for Germany and has, of course, to do uh, not with the others, but uh, as well with the German uh, politics. Um, and that is, uh, whether or not it's true, it's, it's a problem for German foreign policy in itself. Yeah, no, and it, it strikes me, it's interesting, it strikes me, it's, it's the nature of German politics where you're often having a de debate between the opposition and, and the government, or even within the coalition, about the best thing to do, and often a very public debate, and portion, you know, throwaway comments by often not very important politicians are seized on in the, in the international press as speaking for the essence of Germany. And the opposite is in the United Kingdom, where one person speaks, the prime minister, and he massively overpromises and lies all the time, but it creates a sort of impression of British decisiveness and, and, and German hesitance, which probably doesn't square with reality. Very interesting reactions. Uh, another question mm -hmm. for the audience, uh, and this Twitter is exploding over this one, and this is the banning of Ukrainian uh, symbols at the May 9th demonstrations, not allowing Ukrainian flags on the Soviet war memorial in the center of Berlin or in Treptow. Um, what's the explanation for, for that? Well, the explanation is that uh, Germany has not enough experience with conflicts in other regions um, and then spilling on their territory. We have had fights between Kurds and Turks, Israelis and Palestinians and other, other people on our territory. It often got... Uh, quite messy and, and brutal. And uh, in particular, I think in Berlin, which has a large um, uh, Russian community and Ukrainian community, I think uh, the police and the, uh, the, the local government decided they tried uh, to mute this public provocation, as it was called, uh, during this uh, May 9th event. Whether that was a smart move or not, um, it's highly debatable. I would have said personally, but I'm not in charge, I'm not an elected government official, let's, let's do it, uh, let's allow that. But of course, we could have seen street fights or worse on, on Berlin Street, um, that's for sure. And you, I can tell you from my own university that uh, you know it can get quite testy uh, between Palestinians and Israelis and and other nations uh, in German un universities too. So I can relate to that and understand that although I have a different opinion, policy position on it. Yeah, yeah, and, and spray graffiti on the Soviet war memorial in Berlin would have been a great propaganda cue for Putin himself. Uh, Dr. Solenko you, um, Solenko, you don't have to, but would you like to respond to that? No, I absolutely agree. I can understand the logic of the state authorities of the police 
who was responsible also for, who is responsible for the order so i can understand this decision yeah but of course ukrainians didn't like it and there was a case that uh so, yeah yeah so 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 of course yeah uh, there are emotions about this but i can understand this decision yeah uh, as a prevention of escalation i can well understand it so. yeah yeah okay very helpful uh let's move on to another question and this is yeah this is about the dramatic um revolution in german military spending, the 100 billion, which was just confirmed, I think, last night or the day before, and money for digital security, which the uh, the Greens wanted, is going to come out of a, another pot. So this money is actually going into uh, mostly into military uh, hardware. Um, how much of this is a game changer for Germany, both in this conflict, but also long term? I mean, is Germany... I read some statistic that Germany is going to emerge as the third or fourth largest army in the world. Is Germany finally, is Berlin finally prepared to play the role of a, a, of a regional hegemon, the most powerful country in Europe, and to use its military might to support that position? Professor Harnish? Well, I don't think so. Um, I hope that uh, German military will become more effective. I hope we will be able to supply ammunition to other nations, uh, first and foremost Ukraine. But uh, the price tag for ammunition alone is 20 billion, right? To become NATO compliant. So I think most of the stuff, most of the 100 million will be eaten away by just uh, filling up what was lost over the past 20, 30, 40 uh, years. So in a way, we're normalizing with that budget up to a 2%. But then again, uh, with regard to the German debate and therefore my hesitancy, I mean, uh, former Foreign Minister Gabriel made for a very long time the argument that just imagine that Germany would... Uh, achieve the two-point GDP goal of NATO, then we would by far be the largest um, army in Europe, and then all the other Europeans would start um, not to bandwagon with Germany, but to balance against Germany, because we once again would be threatening to our small partners. And part of that discourse we have heard today. I don't know whether Irina would be so um, okay with Germany being uh, a well-armed great power um, uh, in coalition with Russia and then going into Poland and, you, and Ukraine after all, right? So these sentiments are still there and therefore I think the, the green position that they wanted to spend parts of that money to effectuate defense by other European nations. So not spending it in Germany, but spending it elsewhere in Europe would be part of the move. And I think the solution will be, last sentence, Germany will try to go big time as a framework nation where, you know, Germany is the biggest force, but smaller forces are um, really integrated into that defense capability and that German forces are integrated in a way that they cannot go it alone. Okay, great. Arena, we have basically one minute left. You, get, you have the, the last word and respond to this. The Germans can't win. When they're inactive, they're, they're attacked for being too passive. And when they exercise leadership, they're attacked for being bullies. So it's no fun being a German. Could you could you respond to that, Arlena? I think it is important to note what kind of political system, what kind of political system the country has, which which owns or has weapons. And for me, Germany would not be a threat because Germany has very good checks and balances. It is a democratic society. I don't have any problems really with uh, with that. I have problems with Russia, which is an autocratic countries and owns nuclear weapons. For me, this is a problem. Uh, so I think it's it's a very much interrelated. The political system, uh, the uh, exactly. 
it's an important um, aspect, crucial right. aspect for me. Sorry. Excellent. Well, I'm afraid we're out of time. Uh, thank you, Sebastian, Kai, Arena, for really a fascinating discussion. Thank you to the audience for your questions. And thanks to Larissa and Olga for helping organize this event. So everyone have enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Yeah.